extraordinary to think that only in the last 12,000 years has civilization, as we understand it, taken off. There must have been an extraordinary explosion in 10,000 BC, and there was. And man who had come through these incredible hardships and marched up from Africa over the last million years, had battled through three ice ages, suddenly found ground flowering and the animals surrounding him and moved into a different kind of life. It's usually called the agricultural revolution. But I think of it as something much wider, the biological revolution. There was intertwined in it the cultivation of plants and the domestication of animals in a kind of leapfrog. And under this ran the crucial realization that man dominates his environment in its most important aspect, not physically, but at the level of living things, plants and animals. With that, there comes an equally powerful social revolution. Because now it became possible, more than that, it became necessary for man to settle. And this creature that had roamed and marched for a million years had to make the crucial decision whether he would cease to be a nomad and become a villager. As for people who never made it, there are few survivors. There are some nomad tribes who still go through these vast transhuman journeys from one grazing ground to another. The Bakhtiari in Persia, for example. And you have actually to travel with them and live with them to understand that civilization can never grow up on the move. Everything in nomad life is immemorial. Sheep and goats were first domesticated about 10,000 years ago. The life of the nomads is an endless struggle, an endless ritual to live by keeping their animals alive. They have only the simple technology that can be carried on daily journeys from place to place. The simplicity is not romantic. It's a matter of survival. When the women spin wool with their simple ancient devices, it's for immediate use to make the repairs that are essential on the journey and no more. The Bakhtiari life is too narrow to have time or skill for specialization. There is no room for innovation because there is not time between evening and morning to develop a new device or a new thought. The only ambition of the son is to be like the father. It's a life without features. Sheep and goats have no natural migrations. When man domesticated them, he took on the responsibility of nature. The nomad must lead the helpless herd. It's a heroic adventure, and yet the Bakhtiari are not so much heroic as stoic, resigned because the adventure leads nowhere. There is no promised land. The largest single step in the ascent of man is the change from nomad to village agriculture. What made that possible? A hybrid wheat appeared in the Middle East. It happened in many places. People who harvested wheat but did not yet know how to plant it. And we know now that bread wheat would not have been fertile but for a specific genetic mutation on one chromosome. Now we have a beautiful ear of wheat, but one which will never spread in the wind because the ear is too tight to break up. And if I do break it up, why then the chaff flies off and every grain falls exactly where it grew. Suddenly, man and the plant have come together. Man has a wheat that he lives by, but the wheat also thinks that man was made for him because only so can it be propagated. Wheat and water turned that barren hillside into 
the oldest city of the world. The women ground the wheat with the heavy stone implements that characterize a settled community. The men shaped, patted, and molded the clay for these bricks, some of the earliest known. Man, like the bread wheat, is now fixed in his place. Agriculture creates a technology from which all physics, all science, takes off. The most powerful invention in all agriculture is, of course, the plough. We think of the plough as a wedge dividing the soil, and the wedge is an important early mechanical invention. But the plough is also something much more fundamental. It is a lever which lifts the soil, and it is the first application of the principle of the lever. When, long afterwards, Archimedes explained the theory of the lever to the Greeks, he said that with a lever he could move the earth. But thousands of years before that, the plowman of the Middle East had been saying, give me a lever and I will feed the earth. The wheel is found for the first time before 3000 BC, and from then on, the wheel and the axle become the taproot from which invention grows. For example, it's turned into an instrument for grinding wheat and using the forces of nature to do that. The animal forces first, and later the forces of wind and water. The mechanical engineers of Sumer and Assyria turned the wheel into a pulley to draw water. At the same time, they designed large-scale irrigation systems. They are a late construction of a city civilization, and they imply the existence by then of laws to govern water rights and land tenure and other social relations. Now the social structure is bound up with the regulation of matters that affect the community as a whole. By now, the village artisan has become an inventor in his own right. He combines the basic mechanical principles in sophisticated tools which are, in effect, early machines. A machine is a device for tapping the power in nature. That's true of the simplest spindle that the Bakhtiari women carry, all the way to the historic first nuclear reactor and all its busy progeny. The fact is that agriculture and the settled way of life were established steps now in the ascent of man, and had set a new level for a form of human harmony which was to bear fruit into the far future, the organization of the city. The history of man is divided very unequally. There is his biological evolution, all the steps that separate us from our ape ancestors. Those occupied some millions of years. And then there is his cultural history, all that separates us from the few surviving hunting tribes of Africa or food gatherers of Australia. And all that enormous cultural gap is in fact crowded into a few thousand years. <laughs>